Okay, and so now I'm going to read from the fictional treat the fictional story that um, I was inspired to write as a real result of doing this, this research. And I can tell you that in addition to um, interviewing these guys, I went over, um, there was an, a, eventually there was a conviction. And um, um, I went over, I got to listen to all these, ta all these court, now they have court videotapes instead of court re recorder stuff. Okay, this is called King Cole's American Salvage. On a windy evening in February, William Slocum, Jr., 11 months out of prison, pulled into King Cole's driveway in a Jeep he'd stolen from an apartment complex near his girlfriend's house. He'd cut through the Jeep's canvas top with a utility knife, popped the ignition with a screwdriver, and hot-wired the engine, a trick William Slocum, Sr. had taught him not long before passing out drunk on the railroad tracks. Slocum's car had broken down two days ago, and King Cole of King Cole's American Salvage had given him $70 for it, minimum scrap price. That old Mitsubishi Montero hadn't been registered or insured, so if he'd left it broken down in the road, the city of Kalamazoo would have impounded it. But still, Slocum felt Cole had ripped him off, had not given him what the car was worth. Slocum and his girlfriend Wanda were now without any car since hers had been repossessed two months ago. She also hadn't managed to pay her mortgage or get enough methamphetamine to keep herself going since she lost her job. And Slocum hadn't been getting any work either, so things were tight. He tried to make love with Wanda last night, but without the meth, it wasn't working. And he knew tonight he needed to hit a lick. If he didn't, Wanda was bound to lose faith in him. Slocum got out of the Jeep, carrying with him a length of galvanized pipe he'd swiped from Parker's auto repair, where he bought meth sometimes, and where he'd met Johnny Cole, King Cole's nephew. They'd known each other less than two weeks, but right off, Slocum knew Johnny was a solid guy. Although he was five years younger than Slocum and still pocked with acne, Johnny was generous with the homegrown and seemed like the kind of person you could trust, a rare quality. Slocum had liked the way the kid had asked his advice and had seemed to look up to him. Slocum knocked hard on King Cole's ornate wood and wrought iron front door, and in about a minute, King swung open an upstairs casement window and turned on the security light, which lit up the crusted snow. Slocum could see by the tire tracks that the tow truck was the only vehicle that had been there recently. According to Johnny, the man's wife had died years ago. And according to the sticker on the window, Cole had an alarm system. What do you want? Cole said through the screen. The small man stood with one hand on his pot belly. His long beard and shoulder length hair were black. Johnny had told him the old man dyed it because he thought it made him attractive to the ladies. I need a jump start, or maybe a tow, Slocum said. I don't work at night. Call somebody else. Cole started to close the window. I'm a friend of Johnny's, Slocum said quickly and backed up so King could see him better. Your nephew Johnny, you scrapped out my old car the other day, the blue Mitsubishi. Cole opened the window again. That Jap crap isn't worth a shit. That's what you said. Slocum had stayed up late smoking and drinking beer with Johnny a few nights ago, and when Johnny was stoned, he told Slocum what a cheap bastard King Cole was, how Johnny worked his ass off for his uncle, but the man wouldn't lend Johnny enough money to buy some old diesel truck he wanted. King Cole didn't like banks, Johnny had said, and he carried a shitload of money on him, thousands of dollars in hidden pockets in his jacket. I should go out to his house late some night, and negotiate my own loan, Johnny had said, and they both laughed. So that's the fictional version. And you can see how a lot of the elements from the, often when you write fictional stories, the elements don't come out so particularly, but in this, in this story they do. So let me just uh, read two poems that were inspired by, I really hung out at the junkyard a lot, so I got very, it was great. <laughs> Great work if you can get it, just hanging out at junkyards. Um, this uh, one, one poem that's kind of a poem about what happened is called Lake and Olmstead. 
That's the main cross streets in my neighborhood. Everybody rises up again in this place like a bunch of stoned, hungry phoenixes with acne and ringworm and knuckle tattoos. The rapist gets out of jail with a boner for the liquor store clerk. Nobody pays child support and abortions don't take. Fetuses cling to uteri like barnacles to boat bottoms. The boys who cook meth bash open the head of our tow truck driver, leave him in the snow to die, and he lies there for a day moaning at first and then a long time silence. But he rises up again to drive his tow truck, to tow the uninsured cars of coke whores and scrap metal thieves. We build a shrine to him in the bloody snow where his brains leaked out. Only a few of us rob him now. And one of my favorite things about being at the scrapyard was watching human beings tearing apart cars. I mean, human beings, like delicate ones like us, only they're tearing apart a machine like that, as complicated as a car. So uh, it was really interesting. And that's the final image that I end my fictional story on. So this was just a little piece I wrote about this. It's called Winter Song in the Salvage Yard. The snow-covered Lincoln shivers beneath your propane torch. Imagine this junkyard in flames oiled hot enough to melt ice and tires, hot enough to turn platinum to gold. Only one naked lady in the place, a cartoon from 1964. Whiskey and brake fluid thaw frozen blood, lubricate the hard pumping heart. A skinny kid offers you a tenner for a holly carburetor. Your voice carries over the noise of the tire machine. Son, you ain't getting it for less than 20. Oh, save me from grease and steel, you sing, as you hoist the Lincoln aloft. Reveal its belly and climb on under, singing, Lord, give me this catalytic converter. Don't let this beast fall and crush me. Let me yank this bastard starter cold as the pump handle, singing, don't let me die before I'm old, as you knock off those icy tires with a sledgehammer swung like a sword. Oh, Lord. Break free these stainless steel lines, and don't let a beautiful woman walk through that gate to shake me up. Don't send me an angel. Don't carry me away. 